Hey guys, so uh, today we are going to be starting a new standard up by, up until this point. By this time, you should have already completed your standards one through three quiz on Google Classroom. Um, if you haven't done so, you really need to reach out with reach out to me um, and let's figure something out in terms of getting that quiz made up. Uh, it's very important for you to take that quiz because uh, it's just kind of gives me an idea of where we're at in terms of you know how well you mastered the content and what we need to go back over as a class so uh, it's crucial that you get that quiz made up within the next you know within the week by the end of the week um, so before we start standard four um, I want to everybody should be on slide 36 of their interactive notebook so I'm going to zoom in right here um, and so at the top of slide 36, it says steps to the American Revolution. Um, these are all things that this graphic organizer is things that we have all talked about uh, in, st in standards one through three, especially in standard three. We talked about all of these things. And so uh, I feel like this is a really good summarizer for just kind of summarizing up the steps to the American Revolution. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to uh Pause this video and in, in, in your interactive notebook on slide 36, um, I want you to fill out these graphic organizers. So you'll see that uh, French and French Indian War is asking you to tell me what was the result of the French and Indian War. Type that here. Uh, give me a one word summary of the Treaty of Paris 1763. So what did it do? Uh, find me a picture of the Proclamation of 1763. Remember the Proclamation of 1763 is that imaginary line that runs along the Appalachian Mountains that said settlers couldn't settle west of that line. Uh, so find me a picture of that proclamation of 1763. Uh, give me a two-sentence explanation for the Boston Tea Party. Why did the Boston Tea Party happen? And what were the results of it? So that should be pretty easy to do. Uh, find me a picture of the Boston Massacre in 1770. Remember, Boston Massacre happens because protesters uh, Sons of Liberties were protesting the Townshend Acts that had been passed on the colonies, uh, and the Boston Massacre is going to result in the death of five colonists who were unarmed. Uh, Stamp Act of 1765, you're going to tweet like you are a colonist that is protesting uh, the Stamp Act of 1765. Remember, the Stamp Act of 1765 placed a tax on all pro paper products, so Tweet like you would be tweeting as a colonist protesting the Stamp Act. Uh, intolerable acts or the coercive acts of acts of 1774 are going to be a result of the Boston Tea Party. So you're going to tell me what was the result of this act. What did the intolerable act do is what I want to know. So when you tell me the result of this act, tell me what the intolerable acts of 1774 did. Uh, Lexington and Concord, 1775. Insert a picture here. So Google Lexington and Concord and put a picture in this box below. Uh, and then lastly, Second Continental Congress slash Olive Branch Petition. You're going to tweet as though you were King George III, and you're going to give the colonists their response, uh, your response to their Olive Branch Petition, which was asking for peace uh, between the colonies in Great Britain. So uh, we, we talked about that in our notes last week, so you should know what King George's response was. Uh, Washington selected as Commander-in-Chief, 1775. Give me three reasons why Washington is fit for the job. We talked about those three reasons in our video last week, so that you should be able to bullet point. You just make a bullet to point list for three reasons why he's fit for the job. And then lastly, Thomas Paine's Common Sense, uh, published in January 1776. Give me a one-sentence summary of what Thomas Paine's common sense, what was the whole idea uh, behind his common sense pamphlet. So pause this video, uh, take 10, 15 minutes to fill this out. Make sure you have each one of the boxes filled out and that you're doing what it's asking you to do in that box. Uh, and then we will move on to starting standard four. All right, so at this point, you should have completed slide 36. You should have filled in all those boxes for standard, uh, to summarize standard three and the, the steps to the American Revolution. So we should be on slide 37 now. So starting a new standard, standard four, uh, we're going to be able to analyze the ideological, military, social, and diplomatic aspects of the American Revolution. So now we are getting into the actual American Revolution, how we got there. Uh, how, when we declared our independence through the Declaration of Independence, uh, what the Committee of Five was, uh, looking at the 
reason and significance of the French alliance with the United States, including the diplomacy of Ben Franklin from Pennsylvania and John Adams from Massachusetts. Look at George Washington as a military leader uh, and then look at the influence of uh, individuals like Baron von Steuben, Marquis de Lafayette, and the significance of Valley Forge in the creation of a professional military. Uh, look at the role of geography in these three major battles, Battle of Trenton, Saratoga, and Yorktown. And then look at the roles of women, American Indians, and enslaved and free blacks in supporting the war effort. And then here's another Treaty of Paris, 1783. So like we always do when we're unpacking a standard, I want you to pause the video. And on slide 37 of your interactive notebook, you are going to unpack the standard. So you're going to list the people in groups, the major people in groups that we're going to come across in standard four, uh, the places in time. Uh, of standard for events and humanities, what major events and humanities, and then what is this standard asking us to do? So again, pause the video, take a couple minutes, and unpack this standard. So going back to unpacking the standard, looking at the people in groups. So I'm going to kind of run through this real quick. People in groups of standard four, uh, starting most notably with Thomas Jefferson and the Committee of Five. So that should be the first thing on your list for people in groups, Thomas Jefferson and the Committee of Five. Um, you also need to have the French. Uh, that is going to be very big. That's another group, the French, French Alliance. And then you need to have Ben Franklin and John Adams. So, so far in people in groups, our list should have Thomas Jefferson and the Committee of Five, the French, Ben Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams. Okay. Moving on with people in groups, you should have put down George Washington. That's a major figure in Standard 4. And also put down Baron von Steuben and Marquis de Lafayette. Those three guys, those three generals are going to be very crucial in the American Revolution. George Washington obviously is American. Baron von Steuben is going to be a Hessian or German. And Marquis de Lafayette is going to be from France. Um, people in groups also looking at women, American Indians, and then enslaved and free blacks. So those should be the last three groups that you have listed in this box right here. Women, American Indians and enslaved and freed blacks. All right, so going to places in time, what time century are we in? Since it's the 1700s, we are going to be in the 18th century. So you should have 18th century, uh, and you need to put um, North America. Uh, this war is going to be fought in North America. So 18th century, North America, those are going to be our broad places in time. Uh, but we're going to get more specific with our places uh, you need to put down Valley Forge is one of the first places we come across, Valley Forge. You also need to put Trenton, Saratoga, and Yorktown. So Valley Forge, Trenton, Saratoga, and Yorktown are going to be specific places that we talk about in Standard 4. And then our year, our specific year in Standard 4 is going to be 1783 which is going to be when the American Revolution officially ends with the Treaty of Paris. Okay, so make sure you have those in there for places in time. All right, events and humanities. Uh, starting at the top of the standard, we're going to go with uh, the American Revolution. That should be number one on your list, the American Revolution. Uh, after the American Revolution, you should have put Declaration of Independence should have been typed down in your events and humanities box. Okay. Next, you should say you should have French Alliance and other foreign assistance. French Alliance and other foreign assistance. And then you should have diplomacy of Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. I know we listed these two as in our people and groups, but their diplomacy is a major factor in the standard of major events. So diplomacy of Benjamin Franklin and John Adams will also go into that events and humanities box. <clears throat> Uh, you need to put also uh, George Washington as a military leader. Again, I know we put George Washington in the people in groups box, but you need to put down George Washington as a military leader in that events and humanities box, as well as significance of Valley Forge. So while Valley Forge is a specific place we talk about, the overall significant is an event in humanity that we will also discuss. So George Washington as a military leader and then significance of Valley Forge. 
Okay. Also looking in our events and humanities, we're looking at the role of geography. Okay. And then the role of women, American Indians, enslaved and free blacks. Again, I know that these are groups that we listed in the people and groups, but their roles are need to be going in events and humanities. So role of geography and the role, uh, roles of women, American Indians, and enslaved and free blacks should also be in there as well. And then lastly, in our events and humanities, we're putting the Treaty of Paris 1783, which ends the war. So Treaty of Paris 1783. Okay. And then lastly, for our last box, do the verbs within the standard. What is this standard asking us to do? Uh, it's asking us to analyze. Okay, so you should have analyze in there. Investigate. Explain. And examine. Okay, again, it's only four, four verbs. Analyze, investigate, explain, and examine. Again, if they repeat, you don't have to write them more than once. There's you got to write them once. Analyze, investigate, explain, and examine. Okay, so that should get you through unpacking standard four. So if you'll go to slide 38, again, uh, like we do with every standard, you have new vocab. This time you have three pages. So I'm going to give you a little bit longer to complete the vocab. So slides 38, 39, and 40 are going to be your vocab um, for standard four. So uh, this is going to be today is Wednesday the 23rd. So I will give you uh, until October 2nd to complete. So that's next Friday. Um, so you'll have a week and a half to complete. Um, again, these are really, you'll see that the Battle of Saratoga, you know, those are big battles. So uh, a week and a half, I feel like it's plenty of time to get this done. Um, so you have until October 2nd. That is going to be a Friday to get that done. Okay. So that is our vocab 38, 39, and 40. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and go to slide number 41 in your interactive notebook. It should say excerpts from the Declaration of Independence, July 1776. And so we're going to take a look at the Declaration of Independence. You'll notice that I have highlighted the major facts and big points of each excerpt that I want you to know. And then when I start the presentation, when we get down to the summary of the Declaration of Independence, you will type in what I have on my screen. Uh, and then we will move on to uh, looking at what the Declaration of Independence actually was, typing some notes there. And then lastly, we'll finish up with setting the stage for the American Revolution. But right now we're on slide number 41. I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. Um, and so again, we're on standard four. We're going to look at the and look at four uh, A, which is investigate the intellectual sources, organization, and argument of the Declaration of Independence, including the role of Thomas Jefferson and the Committee of Five. So we're on slide forty one right now. Uh, we've already unpacked standard four on the page. You okay? So now we're on. We're on slide 41, so we're in the top part of slide 41. So here are some vocabulary terms that I want you to know for each of the excerpt, uh, just because I feel like they're super important for you to know. So for excerpt number one on slide number 41 of your notebook, self-evident means obvious. So when we say something is self-evident, self that means it's obvious. We know it's there. Uh, endowed means that it's given to you. So when something is endowed, to you, it's given to you, and then when something is un unalienable, that means it can't be taken away. So we have three basic rights according to the Declaration of Independence that are unalienable, meaning they cannot be taken away from us as individuals, and that's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So those are the key vocab terms for excerpt one. For excerpt two, you have alter. So when you alter something, that means you change it. Okay, so when you alter something, you're changing it. When you abolish something, you're ending it. So uh, when we get to slavery and we talk about the abolishment of slavery, that is the ending of slavery. And then when you institute something, means it means you start something. So when you institute change, that means you start the process of change. So that's key vocab terms for excerpt number three. I mean, excerpt number two. Excerpt number three, uh, usurpation is going to be uh, illegal seizure of power. So when you have someone that is that usurps uh, a government, that means they are illegally seizing power. Uh, indirect object 
means that is the goal of something. So when you are doing something indirect object of your ends, that is your goal. And then tyranny is government by unjust rule. So when something, when there's tyranny, that means that government's being run by unjust rule by somebody that didn't get that power uh, the correct way. Uh, excerpt number four, when you submit to someone, that uh, that is present for judgment. So when you submit a work of art or an essay, that means that you have presented it to be judged by your peers or by somebody else. Candid means that you are being fair. So when I say I'm being candid with something, that means I'm, tr I'm being fair in what I'm talking about. And then to assent is to agree. So when I assent with somebody, that means I agree with them. Uh, and then excerpt number five, oppression is unjust action. So when people are being oppressed, that means unjust action is being put upon them. And then to redress is to provide relief. So when a government redresses the people, that means they are providing relief for those people. So looking at these excerpts, so we're going to break this down into the preamble, the body paragraphs, and the conclusion. So the preamble is going to be the introduction of the Declaration of Independence. This is basically where um, the American people, the Committee of Five, when they're writing the Declaration of Independence, are basically going to be introducing why they are seeking their independence. So looking at excerpt number one, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Uh, that they are endowed, meaning that they are given, uh, they are endowed by their creator, meaning God, with certain unalienable rights. So remember, unalienable, unalienable means cannot be taken away. So they are endowed or given by their creator certain rights that can't be taken away, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So right there in the very first excerpt, the Committee of Five, the American people are telling Great Britain that, look, these truths that, that, you know, that people are given, are born with rights of uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, those are natural rights that can't be taken away from us. So they're setting the stage for what they're about to talk about. Uh, excerpt 2 says that when any, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to, and to institute a new government. So they say that the first excerpt, uh, the American people are telling Great Britain, you know, individuals are born with three rights that can't be taken away, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And then in excerpt two, it says, so that when any of these, when any form of government uh, starts to abuse those rights that individuals have, it is the right of the people to abolish a government, do away with the government, and institute a new one. So that's the introduction. That's how the Declaration of Independence is really, it really starts off right off the top, right off the bat, kind of telling Great Britain, look, we believe we have these rights. We believe that you have, we also believe that we can change government if we feel that the government is abusing these rights that we have. So the grievances, okay, this is our list of complaints. These are our body paragraphs. So this is the, the three complaints, three major complaints that the colonists had against King George and England. So in excerpt number three, it says the history of the present King of Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, meaning that the King is continuing to uh, illegally seize power, force his power upon us when we don't need it. All having a direct object, the establishment of an absolute tyranny or government run by unjust ruler over these states. So first complaint is the colonists don't like the, don't like the way that King George is ruling the colonies. They feel like it's unfair. They feel like it's illegal that these taxes that are being placed on the colonists are illegal because of that lack of representation in Parliament when they were being created. Excerpt number four, the second major complaint, to prove this, that England has interfered with our colonial rights, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. So their second complaint is that King George essentially has uh, refuse to agree to the laws that have been placed forward. He's making up as he goes. He's doing what he wants, and he could care less what the colonies have to say. And then our last major complaint, in every state of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress or relief. And in the most humble terms, our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. And so the colonists are saying, hey, we have asked for relief from Great Britain. We have asked for peace, you know, namely the 
olive branch petition, and the king continues to do harm to us. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be ruler of a free people. And so they said, look, you know, we've asked for continuous relief from the king. We've asked for peace, and he continues to abuse his powers. He isn't fit to rule us anymore. It is now time that we alter and abolish this government and start over with our own freedom and independence. And then lastly, we have our conclusion. So this is kind of where we sum it all up and say, look, we declare independence. We're no longer part of your country. So excerpt six says, we therefore solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. So that's laying the hammer. The colonies essentially are, are wrapping up saying, look, because of all these things, these terrible things you've done to us, we are now declaring ourselves free and independent. We are no longer subjects of England and King George the Third. So let's type in and let's sum this up. So on the bottom part of page 41, you're going to type what I have that pops up in the box. So the preamble is going to be essentially saying everyone is equal. God gives us unalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, meaning that no one can take those away from us as individuals. And if the government denies us those rights, then we have the ability to overthrow it. So that's that's summing up the preamble. Okay, That's basically what that introduction of the Declaration of Independence is saying to King George and England. Okay, Looking at our grievances, our three main complaints. Uh, number one, the king is a tyrant and he abuses his power. That is the number one complaint that the colonists have is that the king's a tyrant, he's an unjust ruler, and he abuses his power repeatedly. The second grievance is that his laws, the King George, his laws are abusive, and he doesn't want to listen to us or obey his own laws. And so the colonists are essentially saying the very laws that King George is passing, he doesn't even follow. So, you know, it doesn't seem fair uh, that he won't follow his own laws. He's just being abusive to us. And then the last complaint is we have asked him to be nicer to us, and he has repeatedly ignored our request, You know, namely citing the Olive Branch petition when the colonists asked for peace. They pledged their loyalty to King George III, and he essentially said, if you don't stop doing what you're doing, you could all be hanged to death. Okay, So those are the three grievances, the three complaints that the colonists had against King George III and Parliament. Okay, So that's their three main complaints. That's a three. That's a three body paragraph. And then, lastly, our conclusion. So, our conclusion is: if it'll pop up here. Don't know what's going on. Okay. So, the conclusion is: we declare the American colonies to be free and independent. So, that's wrapping up the Declaration of Independence, saying we're no longer subjects of England. We're no longer subject to King George III. We are. Our our American colonies are free and independent. So if you need to pause this video, make sure that you have it typed in to your notes on page 41. Uh, once you do that, that is going to be the end of slide 41, kind of just giving a brief look at what how the Declaration of Independence was broken down into these five separate parts. Um, and then on, so on slide 42, which is what we're about to start on next, we're going to take a deeper look into how we got the Declaration of Independence and what it was really about. So Pause this video if you need to. Once you fill in your notes on slide 41, go to slide 42. Okay. So, so uh, real quick before we do this. So, uh, actually, I'm going to skip this. All right. So, Declaration of Independence. Okay, we're on slide 42. So, what I want you to do at the top of slide 42 is I want you to... Uh, Think about the reasons why colonists would want to be free from Great Britain. Okay, Give me a two to three sentence summary for why the colonies would want their independence. So think about all the terrible things that the king has done, uh, especially after the French and the War, all the taxes, um, you know, all of the, the, the awful things he has done, and, and write those down. So why would the American colonies want independence from Great Britain? Okay, So think about some reasons why uh, and put those down at the top of page 42. Okay, so moving further down, say after you answer that question, why would the Americans want independence? Let's look at who actually wrote the Declaration of Independence. So who wrote it? So after the decision to separate from Britain was made, the Continental Congress designated five delegates to draft a rationale for American independence. 
This committee of five will include Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Robert, Roger, Robert Livingston, and Roger Sherman. Jer Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, is going to be asked by the group to write the initial draft of the Declaration of Independence because of his impressive writing style. So these five individuals are going to get into a room in Philadelphia, and they're going to come up with an rationale for independence. So when you see this on your test, which you will, it's going to ask what the purpose of the Committee, to, committee of Five was and what their goal was uh, in Philadelphia. So what was the Declaration of Independence was simply a document that argued why the colonies had a right to separate from the oppressive British government and king and essentially create a government on their own. And then Jefferson will present the draft to the Continental Congress and it will be adopted and signed on July 4th, 1776. Hence why we celebrate July 4th as Independence Day. Okay, so it's going to be adopted and signed on July 4th, 1776, and will eventually make its way throughout the colonies to Continental Congress. George Washington will have it read to his Continental Army to kind of boost morale that now they're fighting for their independence. They're no longer just fighting for their families and their land. They're fighting for their independence. Okay, so here's Thomas Jefferson, picture of Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, and John Adams. So these are going to be three of the five of the Committee of Five who write and draft the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so organization, which you just saw on slide 41, but our, our organization in three parts, the preamble, which is the intro, which states the ideological reasons why the colonists are breaking away, citing John Locke, you know, people have certain rights that can't be taken away from them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Number two, part number two is going to be the grievances or complaints that the colonists have against the British Parliament and King George. It's going to be this justification and evidence of social violations that the British government made and why they're asking and breaking away from the British government. And then lastly, our conclusion, it discusses previous attempts to achieve relief from Britain, most notably the Olive Branch Petition, and will end with them declaring independence from Great Britain. So the final signed document was printed for wide distribution throughout the 13 colony, 13 new and independent states now united in war against Great Britain. Here's a picture of what it looked like. Um, and, you know, it's going to be spread throughout the colonies uh, and read to the Continental Army by distributing the declaration to the colonists. They would unite the colonies in a war effort against Great Britain. So they now are all pulling on the same rope, on the same string uh, and in the same direction. So make sure you have this typed in. Uh, on your notes. Okay, so some sources. So, you know, while Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Roger Sherman, uh, while they were all, Robert Livingston, while they were all very intelligent individuals, they drew their inspiration from somebody. And so uh, the biggest inspiration that they drew drew upon when they're writing the writing of this Declaration of Independence was the writings of John Locke. So the ideas of John Locke's Second Treatise of Government. So you guys have heard about this in government as well as world history. This is, again, the third time that you guys have heard about John Locke. John Locke's going to be an Enlightenment thinker who believed that all people possess natural rights that are unconditional, meaning they cannot be taken away from you. And those rights are a person's life, liberty. And for John Locke, writing in England are going to be property. Thomas Jefferson changes it to the pursuit of happiness because during this time, not everybody in the colonies could own property. It was only adult white males who could own property. So he changed it to the pursuit of happiness um, to kind of fit a broader, to, to fit a wider group, a larger group of the colonists. Um, as part of these natural rights, Locke will propose that people have the right to choose their own form of government and that the government gets its powers from the people or the government. So John Locke is a firm believer and it's something that established our government today is that the government only can do what the people allow it to do. So the government gets its power from the people or those who are being governed. Locke believed the relationship between the people and its government worked kind of like a social contract. So this whole social contract theory helped to justify colonial independence as seen in the preamble or the introduction of the Declaration of Independence. And in this theory, the relationship between people and their government relies on each side's rights and responsibility. So in this social contract theory, the people give the government its power, and in return, the government is supposed to defend and protect the natural rights of the citizens. So the citizens give up some of their rights so that the government can protect them, and in return, the government promises to protect those rights. If the government at any point begins to abuse the power and rights given to it by the 
people and does not uphold their natural rights or uphold their end of the deal, the people have the right to replace or overthrow the government and essentially start a new one. The colonists believed that King George III's government had violated their social contract and abused its power with the implementation uh, implementation. Okay, that, that's a typo. Implementation of unfair taxes, talking about the Sugar Act, Stamp Act, uh, Quartering Act, uh, Intolerable Acts, the Tea Act, all these unfair taxes. Attacks by British forces against colonial citizens, namely the Boston Massacre, and restrictions placed on local colonial assemblies like the Intolerable Acts as well. And so these, all these... Uh, all these things that King George III and his government had done against the colonists made the colonists feel like they were being, that Great Britain, England was violating that social contract that had been established between the colonists and England. And so therefore they said, hey, look, we have, our, we have the right, per the social contract theory, to uh, break away and start over. So natural rights are God-given. You're typing this in off to the side. Natural rights are God-given rights that cannot be taken away life, liberty, and property. According to John Locke, we know that Thomas Jefferson changes that to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, social contract theory is that people enter into a contract with their government. Citizens will give up total freedom, and the government gives them protection. But we understand that when the government starts fails to give them those protections, then the people have a right to overthrow that government. So make sure you have these two things typed into the side of your notes where it says sources. Okay, and then lastly, John Locke's idea will greatly influence the Declaration of Independence. Make sure you have that typed in as well. Okay, so that is it for slide 42 in your notebook. So we have one more slide that we're going to go over with, and we are going to be done for notes today. Um, so slide number 43 is going to be setting the stage, some facts about the American Revolution. So looking at this chart right here, uh, comparing Great Britain and the American colonies or the Continental Army, you'll notice right off the bat that the total population of Great Britain is going to far outnumber the American colonies. So Great Britain's total population is going to be roughly 8 million individuals, while the American colonies only have about 2.5 million. Um, so that, that's, that's quite a lot, almost roughly you know, three and a half, four times the amount of people in Great Britain and compared to that in the American colonies. Number of troops and experience. So even though Great Britain largely outnumbers the American colonies, the number of troops that are are fighting are relatively close. So 133,000 troops for Great Britain compared to 96,500 troops for the American colonies. Great Britain's troops, England's troops are going to be professionally trained. They're going to have a large help with the help from Hessians, which are German mercenaries and loyalists living in the colonies, loyal to King George. Uh, the American colonies, on the other hand, are going to be largely inexperienced soldiers. They're going to be volunteers, mostly city militias, meaning you know farmers, indentured servants, slaves, merchants, etc. They're not going to be a professionally trained army. Okay, They're going to be very small city militias, but to their advantage, they're going to know the land a lot better than the British are. Uh, and then you'll see right here the youngest member uh, of, the, of these militias was 10, while the oldest member was 57. So there really wasn't an age range or an age limit. Um, if you wanted to fight, you could fight. Okay, so who has the advantage um, in this right off the bat? Great Britain does. Great Britain has the numbers and the experience. And so on paper, Great Britain should have done away with the American colonies rather quickly. Uh, the war should have never lasted as long as it did, and Great Britain should have easily won against the American colonies. Um, so reasons to fight the war, so varying reasons. Great Britain is going to fight because they want to keep control of the colonies because why not? It's an economic source, um, a source of income for Great Britain. So they want to keep control of the colonies. They want to keep control of the territory because more land equals more resources equals more money. So the more land and territory you have, the more powerful you are. So those are going to be their reasons. Their, easy, their reasons for Great Britain are more economic compared to the colonies where they are fighting for freedom. They're fighting for their independence. They're fighting from their land. They're fighting to rid themselves of an unfair rule by king and par parliament. And they just love where they live. They're patriotic. They love their land. They love their, their colonies. And so they want to fight to protect that and, and free it from control of King George. Okay. So the colonists are passionate. They have a reason to fight. So their reason to fight is a little bit more uh, personal than it is for 
the British. Um, so some advantages for Great Britain is that they're obviously very wealthy, which is going to play a key factor in terms of supplying troops with weapons, supplies, clothing, and food. They also have a very strong central government to coordinate the war. So they kind of have a central command. It's not all scattered all over the place. They have a central command that makes all the important decisions and they have the best military in the world, army and Navy by far compared to any other countries. On the other hand, the colonists, their advantages are they're very familiar with the land uh, and territory. The British are essentially fighting when they're fighting in the colonies, they're essentially fighting on foreign so soil. So they don't know the land as well as the militias and the continental army and the militias and the colonists are able to use this to advantage with their surprise attacks, their ambush tactics as well. They also, the colonies also have passionate, passionate soldiers and patriots and they'll, will, they, they'll gain alliances later in the war. Um, notably France is going to be the big one, uh, the big ally for the colonies. Uh, some sub difficulties for the British, they're less familiar with the land. So while the colonies are very familiar with the land, they're, the British, on the other hand, are very uh, are very unfamiliar with the land and territory. And they're farther away from supplies and information. So while they are very wealthy and they have you know, the, ability, the ability to supply their troops, um, they're, they're far away from those supplies and information. So it takes months to resupply the British troops while uh, whatever supplies the colonies get, they, they have relatively easy access to those supplies. Um, another difficulty for Great Britain is that they have distractions with competing nations. France, an example, France and Spain are going to be some notable examples, especially when France joins the side of the Americans. So that's going to be a distraction. And then they also have distractions from within. So having an overall war commitment because having commitment in England to fight a war in America doesn't make sense to a lot of English citizens. So you're going to have a lot of uh, problems in terms of commitment from people in England to this war effort. Uh, difficulties for the colonists, little wealth. Okay, They're going to be a poor country. They don't have a strong central government to kind of coordinate all these attacks and these battles. It's all depending on the local militias. And then George Washington, once he takes control, they have a lack of supplies. So they don't have access to supplies, at as many supplies as the British do. But on the other hand, they are able to get what supplies they do have quicker than the British are. And then you have division between loyalists who are loyal to King George and patriots who are uh, trying to rid themselves of rule from King George the Third. So the loyalists are going to be proved to be a thorn in the side of the patriots because they're going to constantly try to get in the way of their efforts to gain their independence. Uh, how many colonists were loyalists? About 20% of the colonists living in uh, the colonies during this time were loyalists. About 19,000 loyalists will actually fight for the British army and the, and the English crown. Um, so 20, that's still a large number uh, compared, you know, 19,000 of the, you know, however many do we say? 133,000 troops, 19,000 of them are gonna be actually colonists who fight and help uh, the British crown in the war. So that is it for today. So we will do a regular lunch schedule Hold on. today. So we will be on a regular lunch schedule today. It'll probably be about 10 or 15 minutes on the regular schedule. Thank you. So that is it for the notes today. Um, I don't have an assignment for you to complete in Google Classroom. Uh, but what that means for you is this would be a good time for you to get to work on your standard four vocabulary, uh, kind of catch up on that, get ahead of that. Uh, the quicker you get it done, the less you have to do because on Wednesday you will have uh, on Friday you have will have an assignment to complete. Not Wednesday, I'm sorry. Today's Wednesday. On Friday you will have an assignment to complete. So um, you don't have an assignment today in Google Classroom. Work on your vocabulary for standard four. If you have any questions, reach out to me on. Remind Google Classroom e email.